Hello, welcome to Science Sunday. Today we're live streaming from the sanctuary at DUUC. Due to the precautions established by the church, all services, forums, and most church-related activities have been postponed, canceled, or will be live streamed. Uh, we're supporting you and help you in this time and hope that uh, you're doing well and thanks for joining us here today. I'm Mike Winter, and along with Scott Thompson, we host the Science Sundays on first and third Sundays of the month. And uh, if you haven't seen us before, we hope you become a regular participant. And those of you that have been at a lot of our services or a lot of our uh, uh, activities, uh, welcome back. We at Science Sunday uh, want to thank this church community for the support that we receive. We strive to make Science Sunday representative of the principles of this church namely a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and also a realization of the interdependent web of life of which we are all a part. Uh, we think that that's an important goal of this church and an important goal of, of each of us, and I hope that you see that come shining through as we, uh, as we present our topics. Thank you very much for being with us today, uh, supporting us, supporting this church, and for supporting Science Sunday. Today I'd like to introduce Scott Thompson, as he discusses the origins of life. If you have questions, uh, Scott is going to announce it a few times during the talk too, but at tscott at humanistchat.org, tscott with a T and then two T's at the end, humanistchat.org, you can send in questions and we'll do our best to answer all the questions that we can get. Thank you very much and with no further ado, Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mike. Welcome to all of you uh, science lovers, those of you who are participating virtually live and those of you who might be seeing this later on. Um, <clears throat> you know, previously in this series of lectures, I've been talking about origins. And we started at the very beginning, which is the Big Bang. And we talked about how matter conceivably and plausibly came into existence from the pure energy fields locked up in the uh, processes of the Big Bang. We talked about how that matter eventually turned into stars and how those stars are forges of creation. In a scientific sense, they create the heavier elements that have gone on to uh, salt the universe with richness. We've got carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and sulfur and iron and so on and so on. And now the big question before us is once we get to the point where stars and planets are formed, how does life plausibly arise? So there are different sorts of questions uh, all wrapped up in this one simple sounding uh, inquiry, how did life arise? People have been thinking about this question probably ever since there have been people. And there's been any number of uh, explanations. Typically, the explanations that preceded the scientific revolution were explanations based on mythology or some kind of uh, imagined cosmology. I'll talk a little bit about those uh, later in the presentation. But one of the wonderful things about science is that instead of saying that many of the things we behold in the natural world are the result of magic, we can find plausible and in many cases verifiable and repeatable explanations for how the universe came to be the way that it is. And this is now beginning to also address the question of how life came to be. So I've talked before about the timeline of the universe. Um, and we're going to start today talking about the, uh, the formation of the Earth, which happened about 4.5, 4.77 billion years ago, something like that. And not too terribly long after that, the, uh, uh, the first hints that life existed is, uh, is to be found in the geologic record. Now, the first sort of living things that we could expect on Earth, um, a couple of interesting points about that. First, it's not at all likely that the first 
sort of uh, self-replicating metabolic information transforming and transmitting processes, it's not at all likely that the first glimmerings of that kind of activity on planet Earth would have been at all exactly like what we see today. I mean, by at all exactly, I mean, you know, with nuclei, uh, cells with a nucleus and a DNA and transcriptase and centrosomes that are involved in uh, splitting cells and all of this, the complex machinery of even a single cell is expected to be far more advanced than anything that uh, was entailed in what's called abiogenesis, which is life from non-living matter. Uh, life plausibly came from uh, simple chemical and complicated chemical reactions uh, in an environment that included uh, a geology and a physical chemistry and an atmospheric chemistry and ocean chemistry that, uh, that are very different than we see today. So we're going to talk about some of those plausibilities. <clears throat> However, uh, again, it's not likely at all that we will find specific fossils, right? Uh, microbes don't fossilize very well, and uh, atoms doing their things, well, they don't leave any sort of fossils. There's a little bit of an exception to that I'll talk about a little later, which is not a direct fossil, but uh, an isotopic kind of residue in the uh, fossil record. Now, in order to continue our exploration of some of these topics, we have to imagine ourselves at a different place and a different time. So once again, we're going to leverage our imaginary ship. I borrowed this idea from Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, they had a spaceship of the imagination. Uh, I'm calling our spaceship of the imagination the daydream. So we're going to take our daydream. We're going to start off back at the time of the uh, solar nebula and the pre-solar nebula when planets, including the Earth and the Moon, uh, first formed out of the uh, dust and debris, the silicates, the iron, the oxygen. Remember last time I said that the Earth is mostly oxygen so that when you stub your toe you shouldn't worry about it. Most of what makes up a rock is oxygen. Um, but you lock that oxygen in a crystalline matrix and it becomes quite, uh, quite tough indeed. But here we are hovering in our spaceship daydream over the, the uh, congealing mass of the solar system and we see here an infant Earth. This infant Earth has the first hints of continents. Recall that last time in our prior lecture I talked about how um, the fluffy, lightweight stuff that first comprised the infant Earth would have, uh, uh, through gravitational differentiation, would have sort of bubbled up and floated to the surface. And we call this lightweight, fluffy stuff granite. And then underneath the granite is a layer of hard, dense basaltic rock, including something called olivine. But our first uh, few million years, perhaps the first billion years of the history of Earth, the Earth was a, um, a very um, physically volatile place with lots of vol volcanism, um, island chains of granite uh, formed by volcanoes that are moving about and, and uh, uh, rubbing into each other and building up the first proto-continents and continental karsks on the planet. So it was a very different world. It did not have oxygen in its atmosphere. In fact, um, it was what we might consider a hellish place. There were uh, meteors that were uh, frequently bombarding the Earth. There, was, there were volcanoes. The oceans were uh, already, uh, even when the oceans first formed, they were likely salty but uh, they had very different chemistry than today. They likely had a lot of dissolved iron in them. And so it's very difficult for scientists to know exactly what the early Earth was like. And this includes the early Earth that would have been the stage for the formation of uh, self-replicating molecules. So, we're going to go, instead of outside to roam around this uh, hellish tundra, we're going to stay safely inside our uh, imaginary spaceship daydream, and we're going to convene in a conference room where we get to see the, uh, uh, the goings-on outside and speculate a little bit about what's plausible in terms of the science. <clears throat> 
So here we are looking out a window at this uh, landscape and imagine that we had all of the proper tools to do samplings of the ocean and the atmosphere and the earth. Um, one thing that we would find is that there is no soil. Soil is largely organic. So the, there might be clays due to weathering, uh, due to the friction between uh, rocks as they slide together or as rocks fall downhill or as uh, tectonic, uh, the, the, the uh, growing tectonic plates rub together, etc. As rain falls, it was probably almost always and constantly rainy on the early earth. And uh, this would have allowed the formation or facilitated the formation of clays and rock dust. Uh, clay is essentially rock dust uh, that can be wetted. But uh, no, no soil for plants to grow, no, uh, no dirt. Uh, human beings were not formed from dirt, nor was any other uh, living thing uh, originally, because dirt itself didn't exist. So when we talk about a simple life form, and you imagine some of the simplest life forms that we know of today, which is a bacterium, such as pictured in this slide, you know, even a bacteria is an incredibly complicated thing. And every bacteria that's alive on Earth today is the inheritor of billions of years of selective evolution. So some bacteria had uh, processes and uh, metabolic processes and information transfer mechanisms and replication mechanisms that were uh, significantly less efficient. This is a highly plausible idea consistent with the evolution we see in macroscopic organisms. <coughs> And uh, even the simplest bacteria and archaea that are around today, like I said, are vastly more complicated than we can expect. The first uh, prebiotic chemical uh, um, operations to be, or the first, uh, first things that we might call life. And that's, this gets us into the delineation between what is life and what isn't life. One of the ways to simply um, deal with this problem is to say, well, life is a special thing, a magical thing. Life was created. Uh, maybe it was created by um, Ahura Mazda or Anahestek or some other deity idea, or maybe like some ancient traditions of the world, uh, life was created by the confluence of chaos and order in some kind of cosmic dance that gave rise to complexity and organization. So these ideas which predate science are not, on the face of it, horrible ideas. People have always been full of curiosity and lacking evidence and lacking the scientific method, they invented stories. Some we would consider more and many we would consider less plausible. But everybody has tried to answer this question. And uh, today, like I said, um, in the modern era, we're at least getting closer to be able to make some reasonable, scientifically informed speculations about these questions. Many of you might recall that uh, back in the, I think it was the, uh, the 60s, it might have been the 50s, I don't have it written down, uh, the, the Miller-Urey experiment, um, where a graduate student uh, approached his uh, professor who had already won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Yuri had already won, uh, won the Nobel Prize and uh, Miller said, you know what, I've got this crazy idea, why don't we try to recreate the way that Earth's atmosphere and oceans uh, were back uh, several billion years ago and uh, I don't know, let's just run a spark through it and see what happens. And this famous uh, Miller experiment called uh, the Miller-Urey experiment um, was uh, something kind of like that. They took uh, water and uh, a, a kind of primordial soup. Uh, Carl Sagan made that term famous. And he took a, a primordial soup, uh, as was suspected at that time, with, uh, uh, with an atmosphere with methane and carbon dioxide and whatnot, and all of these dissolved chemicals and they ran electrical sparks through this uh, um, um, highly saturated uh, atmosphere in a bottle. 
sat, uh, saturated with water and whatnot. And after a few hours, and certainly after a few days, the clear water in one of the beakers had turned reddish. And when they looked at that, they found that it comprised a lot of amino acids. And so since that time, scientists have used telescopes and the, the way that telescopes can look at the spectrum of light uh, either emitted by hot molecules and atoms or reflected off of cooler molecules and atoms. They've used this spectroscopic method and have found that these kinds of amino acid molecules and precursor mo uh, cursor molecules to things like lipids or fats, these kinds of uh, basic um, stuck together atoms of hydrogen and helium and, uh, and sulfur and carbon uh, not helium, sorry, hydrogen and, and oxygen and carbon, etc. These kinds of amino acids are everywhere that we look. They're out in space. They couldn't conceivably have come from Earth, but they're out there. Now, these aren't living things. They're not living molecules, but they are molecules, relatively complicated molecules, that are used ubiquitously by every form of life we've ever seen, as is water. So carbon, water, hydrogen, uh, sulfur, nitrogen, these atoms are everywhere in the universe. We don't have to rely on uh, some science fiction notion of silicon-based life uh, because silicon tends to make much stronger bonds and uh, look at the way quartz is, uh, silicon uh, dioxide. Silicon and oxygen bind together so firmly that it's really hard to get any dynamic chemistry out of that duo. But Oxygen and carbon aren't quite as chummy as silicon and oxygen, and uh, so we can do some really complex chemistry with carbon. So it's plausible that life in whatever form, or living processes, or proto-living processes, involved some chemistry involving um, uh, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, the same sorts of atoms and molecules that are involved today and uh, that we see with um, amino acids. So Charles Darwin famously back in a letter to uh, his friend uh, Joseph Hooker, I believe in 1871, said, uh, said something very speculative. Now Charles Darwin lived at a time when nobody knew about genetics. Nobody knew about DNA. Um, that's not strictly true. Uh, Mendel had done some of his experiments with peas and uh, um, had found uh, heritability and ideas that would eventually turn into ideas of genetics. But Darwin uh, uh, very provably did not know about any of this. So Darwin didn't know about DNA, he didn't know about the double helix, he didn't know how cells worked, he didn't know anything about ribosomes and transcriptase and all of these complicated processes within a cell. But he did know that life was comprised of molecules and atoms of the regular kind of stuff we see around us every day. And he speculated in this 1871 letter to Joseph Hooker, that maybe somewhere on the early earth in some warm little pond, chemicals, just pure chemicals, came together in a way that uh, they precipitated out of this muck and uh, grabbed onto one another and started uh, self-replication process and began the long chain of consequences that we call natural selection. Uh, molecules that were more efficient at replicating themselves, it would be really a stretch to call these living molecules, but any molecule that would replicate itself more efficiently would become more prolific and a uh, higher concentration than uh, molecules that were less efficient at replicating themselves. So Darwin had this idea of a warm little pond with uh, um, clement conditions where living, um, living things might have gotten their start as self-assembling molecules. And we'll see that uh, this idea of the, uh, uh, the prebiotic soup full of amino acids and lipids and whatnot is quite plausible. Again, these chemicals are everywhere in the universe and uh, they were everywhere on the prebiotic Earth, or at least in many places there were concentrations of these molecules quite plausibly on the prebiotic Earth. 
So if we look at the uh, uh, proverbial tree of life, this is one of the representations of that tree that I prefer. It's a kind of a modern take on the idea. And uh, this shows that there are many um, sort of primary branches of this, uh, of this living uh, population on planet Earth. And uh, the time, as it were, starts in the center of this wheel. And then as time progresses towards the edges of the wheel, um, uh, species uh, evolve and change and isolated populations of species in micro environments like a particular uh, uh, pleasant cove in the, in the ocean or a macroscopic environment like an island that's become or a continent that's become separated from other land masses on earth. Um, the, this idea of separating populations and subjecting different subsets of populations to different environmental constraints leads naturally to the idea of natural selection. But at the center of this wheel, something extraordinary happened, and that's what we want to talk about today. At the center of this wheel is something that biologists have called LUCA. LUCA stands for the last universal common ancestor. And so back in the 70s or 80s and before, there was this hypothesis that there was one living entity. And from that one entity, <coughs> all the remaining um, organisms on Earth have eventually evolved. Now, <coughs> the problem with that, I, by the way, I've had this cough for two months. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not particularly worried about it. Um, in any case, if you try to zoom in in this tree of life to the, uh, to, the, to the root level, as it were, again, this doesn't really look like a tree, it's more of a wheel. If you zoom in to the wheel of life at the very hub, at the center, instead of finding evidence of one single ancestor, we find something quite different. Scientists find something quite different. Instead, they find this tangled mess where it's not at all clear what the lineage is that relates one microbe to another. Uh, microbes that live in vastly different habitats may share some uh, chemical properties, some proteins, some uh, uh, biochemical um, uh, pathways in their metabolism. And yet, they may have very distinct pathways and chemical processes, too. And this gets to the idea that I'm not going to delve into too much today called horizontal gene transfer, where if you're really tiny, then uh, you can learn tricks from your neighbors, genetic tricks, by exchanging little bits of your genome directly without going through uh, sexual reproduction or um, uh, cell division, etc. So this is evidence that at the very beginning, life was exceptionally gregarious. It was constantly exchanging bits of information and molecular processes and metabolites. And if one plausibly gets rid of the notion of a cell wall, even, then you can imagine just uh, little chemical replicators that are um, living in an environment where they exchange information uh, fairly freely. But in any case, without having to dig back into some hypothetical microbial fossil record, just looking at the microorganisms that are extant today, we see evidence of horizontal gene transfer that completely obliterate this notion that there was a single primeval LUCA organism that was the first living thing on Earth. There was a morass of chemical processes and biological or proto-biological processes. And from this mass, uh, eventually, um, at least one mic successful microbe arised, arose. So here's this uh, ancient question that has vexed philosophers and school children for generations. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? And according to um, the scientifically proven fact of Darwinian evolution, something slightly different from a chicken 
laid an egg that inherited a mutation or that had its own mutation that made it a little different than its grandparent chickens or perhaps even its parent chickens. And if you take this analogy back far enough, chickens were at one point dinosaurs. In fact, all birds were dinosaurs and dinosaurs laid eggs. So in terms of which came first, the chicken or the egg, well, eggs predated chickens. But if you want to have a chicken, something that was a little different than what you might deem a chicken, genetically speaking, and maybe even physiologically speaking, if you go back enough great-great-grandparents, something a little different than a chicken laid an egg that became a chicken. So depending on one's point of view, you can provide a scientific answer to this in uh, several different ways. Well, there's a similar set of problems entailed in notions about the origin of life. The question is, we've got three significant pillars to the processes of life that are uh, exhibited to this day. And that involves an exchange of information, the development of structure that allows an organism to thrive in a particular environment and to separate itself from that environment, to provide a barrier between oneself and the other. Um, so that your, uh, your insides don't leak out. So this idea of barriers and structures and internal structures and, you know, we have organs, cells, and even bacteria have organelles. And then finally, uh, information structure and then metabolism. You know, how does a living thing extract information, uh, I'm sorry, extract energy from its environment and use that energy to drive the kind of nanomachine the biologically, uh, the biochemical nanomachines that uh, compel uh, life to do its thing. So information, structure, and metabolism. Now, hearkening back to our chicken and egg question, the relevant question is, which of these came first? An information transfer mechanism, such as DNA, uh, genes and DNA to RNA, uh, to proteins, or was it a structure thing with cell walls and membranes and uh, ribosomes and other specific structures? Or was it a metabolism thing where uh, energy, usually in the form of some kind of aqueous um, uh, ion that is a, a kind of uh, electrical current, drives uh, uh, biochemical processes? Well, the uh, um, a, Scientists don't yet know the answer to this in a definitive way, but there are certain contexts that they've imagined that would be plausible on a primitive Earth that would combine more than one of these things in the same general um, uh, location, uh, same ecosystem, if you will. So, you know, when we're talking about structure, we've got cytoplasms and ribosomes and, and cells uh, today have uh, mitochondria, et cetera. And, you know, a, a, the kind of cell that goes into making you or I or a, a puppy dog or uh, any other multicellular creature is phenomenally complex. The complexity is evident also in its metabolism. Um, you know, you've heard about the Krebs cycle, but there are thousands of chemical reactions entailed in um, releasing energy from different food sources, molecular food sources, uh, in nature. And then uh, information processing, as I alluded to, you've got DNA transcribed by messenger RNA, uh, etc. And I'll talk a little more about that in, uh, in a minute. But Here's something very, very interesting that scientists first noted um, at least 50 years ago. And if you zoom in to what happens in a living cell, whether it's a, a relatively simple cell like a bacterium or a com relatively much more complicated cell called a eukaryote, which is the kinds of cells that uh, multicellular organisms have, uh, and some single cell organisms. But if you zoom in on the mechanisms, of eukaryotes and bacteria and another um, whole class or kingdom of animals called archaea and you look at the way that they do their chemical business at a microscopic level, you find this amazing commonality. 
Within this, you see that there's messenger RNA that carries information. And this messenger RNA serves as a template. And you have then these uh, uh, transport RNA that grab on to amino acids within the cytoplasm of the cell or the environment of the cell. And remember, these kinds of um, uh, amino acids are produced naturally through natural chemical processes. They're so easily produced that they're produced in places where there can't possibly, as far as we can extrapolate, be living things like in the tail of a comet or in the dust around a baby star or in the laboratory breaker of uh, Miller and Urey's experiment. So these transfer RNA have a particular chemical affinity for a particular amino acid and they grab them on and they fit like a lock into a key or a key into a lock on this messenger RNA. And then this amazing little micro machine within every living cell called a ribosome takes this template of the messenger RNA, which is a, a uh, encoding uh, uh, strand, a strand of in, uh, information encoding, and it uses that to string together one after another of these transfer RNA that carry amino acids. And this is the way a protein gets built. But if you think carefully about this and notice what I've circled in this image, you see that RNA is implicated again and again and again. Sure, there's some DNA in a nucleus, but it's plausible that RNA, because it's so important to these functions, that RNA is one of the fundamental characteristics of living things. In that tangle of life I alluded to, RNA is very, very plausibly ubiquitous. Now, one of the cool things about RNA is that it can do some chemical action on, it, on its own. It can form enzymes, it can form some structures that can operate on other molecules. It's not as efficient at doing that as certain other protein-based molecules, but it can do a bit of it. And here's a wonderful piece of proof that that's true. The ribosome that takes messenger RNA and then facilitates the tacking on of uh, transport RNA that pulls amino acids into a protein chain, that ribosome is mostly made out of RNA. Now, modern ribosomes in every creature that we've looked at also has some proteins tacked onto it, but the operational bits, the crunchy bits of the ribosome is made out of RNA. The part that does the work is made out of RNA. So this is a, all a very good argument that there existed on the primeval Earth this idea that's been called an RNA world. And uh, one of the things that's uh, implicated in this notion is, uh, is that clay serves as a substrate um, before you have information transfer from messenger RNA, long strands of RNA that already have information in them, so we're back to the chicken and egg thing, it has been proven that if you have a moistened clay substrate, and clay tends to build up in layers, like uh, sheets of paper layered on, on top of each other, in between the layers, um, <clears throat> Uh, transfer RNA, which are very simple little bits of RNA, can grab on to these clay layers and form these, uh, these strings along with their attendant um, amino acids. It can form these strings. And, you know, happens billions and trillions of time in a at times in a solution with the right prebiotic molecules. And it's a leap of imagination, but a justifiable one and a plausible one, most scientists think, to say that some of these chains, these random chains of amino acids strung together uh, by thermodynamic and chemical processes on a clay substrate by RNA, some of these would have uh, folded because when you string amino acids together, that has a name. A string of amino acids is called a protein. And proteins, um, 
Different amino acids have different uh, residual charges, positive and negative charges on them, and these charges attract or repel other amino acids, and it causes a string of amino acids to fold into complicated ways, and those complications are part of building literally a machine out of protein. So one plausibility is that this prebiotic world of moistened clay and uh, biomolecule, organic molecules that were not living things per se, um, formed a dynamic place for the generation of uh, random protein bits. And much additional research is being done into that idea to try and see if there's a pre preferential sort of protein or a selection mechanism that the molecules can undergo. Here's a little video clip of how a uh, ribosome works, how it uh, uh, gathers up um, uh, transfer RNA that are just floating around in the environment that have a little bit of uh, uh, amino acid attached and then uh, uses uh, our messenger RNA information strand as a template to string them up and the, string them together in the right order. A very, very primitive machine in life. In fact, every single living cell, whether it's a bacteria or an archaea or a eukaryote, again, which makes up you and chickens and everything else, everything has ribosomes in it. In fact, every cell of your body has about hundred million ribosomes. So they're incredibly tiny little molecular machines. Even a bacteria or an archaea will have something like 10,000 ribosomes in it. And because of differential processes in evolution, one ribosome of one species is not identical to the ribosome of another, but they're all constituted of RNA with more or less proteins tacked on to help improve their uh, chemical efficiency. Amazing stuff. And nowhere in this explanation is there a need for something magical. Now, speaking of magical, one of the arguments that sometimes uh, is levied against the notion of abiogenesis, of life originating from uh, chemical and geological processes is the second law of thermodynamics, right? And the second law of thermo thermodynamics is used to say, well, you know, you can never increase the complexity of a thing, or you can never, um, you can never increase the, uh, the energy of a thing. Energy will tend to dissipate over time and through space. And uh, so the idea that you could collect energy into um, into a biomolecule, that just that goes against the second law of thermodynamics. Well, the second law of thermodynamics applies to the entire universe. And one of the tricks that the universe plays with the laws of physics is that you can locally increase energy and diminish uh, a related quantity called entropy, which I'm not going to talk a lot about. You can do that locally as long as your environment um, uh, loses even more energy or creates even more uh, colloquially, I will call it disorder. So think of it this way. If you have a ball sitting on top of a hill, there's a tendency because of the laws of nature, specifically the law of gravity, there's a tendency for that rock or ball to roll downhill. And that's just the action of the law of nature. And when the, when the ball rolls downhill, and um, uh, hits a bowling pin or a foot, obviously it has energy, energy of motion that it could potentially release. But to get a ball or a boulder rolling downhill in the first place might be difficult. You can imagine some jagged peaks like this, this mountain peak. Now, instead of thinking of this as literal mountains, think of it as energy levels, right? There are energy levels associated with biochemical processes. Now, what if I take this mountain range, as it were, this, uh, this graph of energy levels, and I tilt it a little bit? Well, when I tilt it, if you'll notice, there's still a tendency for the energy to decrease or diminish as you traverse the range. Each one of the troughs is lower than the preceding trough, but there's this little spike of energy preventing a chemical process uh, 
uh, from taking advantage of that and rolling, uh, rolling easily downhill. And this, uh, this uh, idea is entailed in many natural processes where you get the evolution, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's a, probably a poor use of the term, where you get the, uh, the creation of structure because of energetically favorable processes, dissipative structures. And one example is a hurricane. A hurricane has a lot more structure than just a single puffy cloud might have. But this is an emergent structure because of the energetic thermodynamics of what's called a dissipative structure. Nature often finds a way to take advantage of energy gradients, including thermal gradients, and it typically does this in a structured and organized way. Um, these patterns that evolve naturally, I shouldn't use that word, these patterns that occur naturally because of thermodynamic and physical processes are everywhere. We see spiral galaxies, we see spiral hurricanes, we see mud cracks that look like they're patterns laid down by uh, a contractor building an interesting mosaic on a bathroom floor. We even see patterned earth in the form of uh, uh, circles of stone where freezing and thawing cycles differentiate the heavier and lighter stones from the uh, I'm sorry, the heavier, uh, larger stones from the smaller and lighter stones. So this kind of pattern earth arises naturally. Circles formed on earth through no magic whatsoever. It's just thermodynamics doing its thing. But to overcome one of these humps requires something called activation energy. Just like you have to push a ball or a boulder to get started rolling downhill, Many of these chemical processes require um, a, a little bit of energy to be put in, and then you get a lot of energy out of it. Um, that's called catalysis. You get catalytic reactions. And one of the ways that you can make a catalytic process happen is by putting in a lot of energy. Another way that you can do it is that you can lower the activation energy. If you wrap that hill in, um, in, in something like, um, oh, I don't know, something that's easier to climb, right? Uh, you put rungs on the hill instead of just a, a flat surface of granite. If you, put, if you were to carve rungs onto the hill, it would be easier to climb it. Well, in a roughly analogous way, biochemistry can lower the activation energy required for a, a chemical reaction to occur. And in natural processes, these uh, uh, catalyst molecules are called enzymes. Enzymes in biological processes are catalysts that facilitate um, other chemical reactions by changing the activation energy requirements. And one of the cool things is that when you look at the energy of life, the way metabolism happens in living things, you find protons everywhere. The cells of plants that do photosynthesis have chloroplasts in them, and I'm not going to talk a lot about photosynthesis now, but those same plant cells that have chloroplasts also have mitochondria. Mitochondria is called uh, the battery of life because it literally builds up a charge on the inside of the mitochondria that's different from the charge on the outside. It creates literally a battery. And in order for that to happen, protons must preferentially be put inside the mitochondria. This happens by virtue of um, a, a kind of proton pump that is powered by chemicals and by naturally occurring chemicals, by, uh, by the oxidation and reduction processes where uh, uh, oxygen might want to bind, bind uh, might have a tendency energetically to bind with carbon and in the process give up a little bit of energy in the form of motion. And this little bit of motion actually spins quite literally a motor inside of the mitochondria, on the walls of the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, which are in uh, nearly every living cell, 
are actually festooned with tiny little motors that are spun by burning oxygen, just like you burn a pile of leaves, but in a very controlled manner, such that about 88% efficiency of energy transfer happens. Now, you'd think that life might use electrons. We use electrons. We use electrons to power computers and light bulbs and uh, many other things. So why is it that nature leverages protons instead of electrons for some of its most important um, power plants? Well, there's some good, plausible answers for that that I'll get into in a moment. But first, I want to talk about some key discoveries. First, amino acids form spontaneously. I've already talked about that. Lipid spheres also form naturally from prolific pre-biologic uh, processes and organic chemistry. So little spheres, uh, like you see little droplets of oil forming little spheres in uh, dishwater. Um, you can easily create conditions in a plausible prebiotic uh, earth uh, in an aqueous solution where little spheres of uh, self-contained environments form. Uh, photosynthesis is not the oldest metabolic pathway. Photosynthesis is all about freeing up electrons, but those electrons are eventually used to power these proton pumps in mitochondria that exist in the cells of plants. So it looks like proton moti motility, moving protons around, is more fundamental than electron motility. Um, uh, autocatalytic metabolic processes for uh, processing uh, hydrogen molecules, H2 and CO2 are found in all primitive organisms. Every organism on Earth has some kind of metabolic process that entails CO2 and hydrogen. Uh, by the way, you can get protons out of hydrogen by stripping their electrons off. And then ribosomes are common to all living things. Finally, protein, uh, uh, proton gradients and their movement across boundaries uh, uh, through molecular turbines drive all cellular energy. So you put all these things together and it makes you want to look for a place on Earth where protons are naturally liberated and flow across membranes. Well, that has been found. Today, we call this the Lost City. This is a, um, a place on the floor of the ocean where alkaline vents um, um, spew out mineral-rich water, and uh, mineral-laden mineral, mineral -laden water. And these alkali vents are warm and snuggly. They're not like volcanic vents. In fact, they're usually several miles removed from the actual spreading center where the uh, tectonic plates are pulling apart and you've got uh, magma and uh, boiling water. This is just warm water. And interestingly enough, the processes by which these minerals condense as they bubble up through the mantle um, form these chambered structures. And these chambers have a size roughly about the same size. They can be as small as a bacteria. So you've got this chamber with, um, with uh, mineral particles on it and protons flowing through it. And inside, you've got this aqueous uh, environment, this uh, seawater. And on the, on the primitive Earth, the seawater was a little different. It had a lot of iron dissolved in it. So the chemistry that happened on the primitive Earth is likely a bit different than the chemistry happening on the modern Earth where these are. But this is a plausible environment for how life's biochemistry could have been jump-started by a natural flow of protons. And one of the ways that these things form, remember last time I talked about uh, the, the mineral olivine um, uh, that is part of the basaltic crust of the earth, when you expose olivine to seawater, it naturally uh, undergoes a chemical reaction that uh, can, can uh, after a series of events, liberate these protons. It's called serpentinization. Olivine turns into serpentine. So where on earth are these things? Well, the first one was found in the mid-Atlantic, about 10 miles away from a spreading center. Since then, there's been another one found, <coughs> I believe it's up by Greenland. 
But these things are enormous um, sort of chemical factories, and even to this day, microbes live there. Um, but we're not expecting brand new biomolecules to be evolved there, because the microbes that already live there, if they see a, a little biomolecule with uh, some uh, potential energy in it, they just gobble it right up. So those newly formed molecules don't have a chance to undergo um, evolution. So three plausibly, relatively straightforward steps to simple life. A proton gradient across an inorganic substrate, which could form a kind of cell, uh, in this case a, uh, uh, a geometric cell, not a living cell. Uh, simple dissipative structures involving um, biochemical metabolic pathways. Now, biochemistry does not necessarily involve life. Biochemistry is just any chemistry involving carbon. So biochemical pathways, metabolic pathways that increase the entropy of the surrounding seawater while decreasing entropy locally. These are all very plausible chemical reactions. And then uh, plentiful reactive per precursors, uh, sheltered environment, the natural proton and gradient, uh, gradient uh, emergent biochemistry was driven by thermodynamic processes to use ever more complex biochemistry to hasten thermodynamic and uh, equilibrium. So life actually contributes to the second law. Anytime you have a living thing, it's dissipating energy into the environment more rapidly than energy would be dissipated if it just reflected off of rocks or off of ocean water. So life accelerates the increase of entropy in the universe, which is entirely consistent with the second law. So one of the other important things that happened in the history of life was that at some point, a prokaryote, which is uh, a different kind of chemical structure, but many of the same uh, biochemical processes, including uh, ribosomes and whatnot, um, a pro, uh, an archaea ate a bacteria, and it didn't die. The bacteria didn't die, and the archaea didn't die. Uh, Lynn Morgolis came up with this idea um, um, several decades ago, and this is called uh, symbiosis, or sim symbiogenesis, I believe. And the idea is that if you take the advantages that have evolved in a bacteria and some of the advantages that have evolved in an archaea, and you combine them into a single entity, you can end up with uh, beginnings of what we call a eukaryotic cell, or a complex cell from simpler beginnings. This is all consistent with Darwin, from simple beginnings, ever more complex living things emerge naturally through natural processes. Now, one plausible thing that could be true, rather than uh, these uh, hydrothermal vents in the ocean, uh, even a primitive ocean that had a slightly different biochemistry, one of the plausible things could be that life got its start on another planet and was transported in the form of uh, bacteria, really robust bacteria that could survive outer space, uh, it was transported to the early Earth. This might help answer the question about how it is that uh, life got started so early on Earth when Earth was still hellishly unpleasant with uh, um, volcanoes and asteroids and uh, tsunamis because of the asteroids and whatnot. Um, Maybe life originated somewhere else and was transported here by uh, a meteorite. You know, we recently had a visitor, Oumuamua was a, uh, a visitor from another solar system that came through here last summer, came through our solar system. So there's nothing unscientific about this explanation, but one of the things it does is it just pushes the, the abiotic or prebiotic chemistry back to a different stage, right? It might happen somewhere else, some when else, but it's still the same prebiotic biochemistry. So whether we're talking about it happening here on Earth or plausibly in, so around some distant star, it's still the same natural biochemical processes. There's no magic involved. There's no need for throwing up our hands and surrender and saying that one of the most complicated things known, in fact, I will go so far as to say it is the most complicated subject known to humanity is biochemistry. And expecting a simple answer to the most complicated thing we know, a simple answer like 
It just happened. That trivializes it and is an invitation for us to just walk away from the problem. Instead, we can pick this problem apart piece by piece and little by little come to a plausible understanding of the way nothing more than nature and nature's rules and chemistry and geology and the atmosphere and the ocean conspired to make replicating molecules from non-living amino acids and lipids and other obviously prebiotic molecules that have been incorporated into the every living thing we see around us today. Why don't we see new life springing up? Well, I alluded to it earlier. Why don't we see life evolving from scratch somewhere else? Maybe using slightly different amino acids and whatnot. Well, because all of these molecules are yummy to bacteria and archaea. So if they're yummy, something's going to eat them. We've had billions of years for bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes to proliferate on our planet. And now, if a novel pre-biologic or nascent biologic process evolves to create some kind of long, complicated sugar molecule, something's going to eat that sugar. So that's one of the reasons why we see everything descended from what looks like a common ancestor is because once one chemical process started undergoing Darwinian evolution, it led to a proliferation of organisms that saturated the environment and closed the door on any new emergence of life. It's like, imagine driving around in an ancient steam-powered uh, automobile. Well, nobody does that anymore because now we've got race cars and hybrid cars and uh, steam-powered automobile just wouldn't have any role to play other than as a novelty in our environment, in our societies. And once you get modern organisms using a replicatable, efficient biochemistry, and this happened billions of years ago, once that happened, we're off to the races, and everything Darwin has taught us about the way natural selection works is relevant and perfectly competent to explain the variety of life we see in the world around us. Finally, here are some books that I've used to inform today's presentation. I encourage you to um, check out from your library or purchase uh, one or more of these books. And I thank all of you for your uh, attention and att virtual attendance today, and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Stay healthy and well.